the old habits of secrecy haven't left Kim Kuk Song. It has taken weeks of discussions to get an interview with him, and he's still worried about who might be listening. He wears dark glasses for the camera, and only two of our team know what we think is his real name. Mr. Kim spent 30 years working his way to the top ranks of North Korea's powerful spy agencies. The agencies were the eyes, ears, and brains of the supreme leader, he says. He claims he kept their secrets, sent assassins to kill their critics, and even built an illegal drugs lab to help raise revolutionary funds. Mr. Kim was the reddest of the red, he says in an exclusive interview. A loyal communist servant, but rank and loyalty do not guarantee your safety in North Korea. He had to flee for his life in 2014, and since then he has been living in Seoul and working for South Korean intelligence. He depicts a North Korean leadership desperate to make cash by any means possible, from drug deals to weapon sales in the Middle East and Africa. He told us about the strategy behind decisions being made in Pyongyang, the regime's attacks on South Korea, and claims that the secretive country spy and cyber networks can reach around the world. We contacted the North Korean embassy in London and the mission in New York for a statement, but have so far received no response. Mr. Kim's last few years in North Korea's top intelligence unit offer some insight into the early career of the current leader, Kim Jong-un. He paints a picture of a young man eager to prove himself as a warrior. North Korea formed a new spy agency, called the Reconnaissance General Bureau, in 2009, just as Kim Jong-un was being groomed to succeed his father, who had suffered a stroke. Chief of the bureau was Kim Jong-kul, who remains one of the North Korean leader's most trusted aides. Dr. The Colonel said that in May 2009, an order came down the chain of command to form a terror task force to kill a former North Korean official who had defected to the South. For Kim Jong-un, it was an act to satisfy the supreme leader Mr. Kim says. A terror force was formed to assassinate Huang Zhengyo in secret. I personally directed and carried out the work. Huang Zhengyo was once one of the country's most powerful officials. He had been a key architect of North Korean policy. His defection to the South in 1997 had never been forgiven. Once in Seoul, he was extremely critical of the regime, and the Kim family wanted revenge. But the assassination attempt went wrong. Two North Korean army majors are still serving 10-year prison sentences in Seoul for the plot. Pyongyang always denied it was involved and claimed South Korea had staged the attempt. Mr. Kim's testimony would suggest otherwise. In North Korea, terrorism is a political tool that protects the highest dignity of Kim Jong il and Kim Jong un, he says. It was a gift to demonstrate the successor's loyalty to his great leader. There was more to come. A year later, in 2010, a South Korean Navy ship, the Chiyonan, sank after being hit by a torpedo. 46 lives were lost. Pyongyang has always denied its involvement. Then, in November that year, dozens of North Korean artillery shells hit the South Korean island of Yongpyeong. Two soldiers and two civilians were killed. There has been much debate over who gave the order for that attack. Mr. Kim said he was not directly involved in the operations on the Chiyonan or Yongpyeong Island, but they were not a secret to RGB officers, it was treated with pride, something to boast about. And those operations would not have happened without orders from the top, he says. In North Korea, even when a road is built, it cannot be done without the direct approval of the supreme leader. The sinking of the Chiyonan and the shelling of Yongpyeong Island are not a thing that could be carried out by subordinates. This kind of military work is designed and implemented by Kim Jong-un's special orders. It's an achievement. Mr. Kim says one of his responsibilities in the North was developing strategies to deal with South Korea. The aim was political subordination that involved having eyes and ears on the ground. There are many cases where I directed spies to go to South Korea and performed operative missions through them. Many cases, he claims. He doesn't elaborate, but he does give us one intriguing example. 
There was a case where a North Korean agent was dispatched and worked at the presidential office in South Korea and returned to North Korea safely. That was in the early 1990s. After working for the Blue House for five to six years, he came back safely and worked at the 314 liaison office of the Labour Party. I can tell you that North Korean operatives are playing an active role in various civil society organizations as well as important institutions in South Korea. I have met several convicted North Korean spies in South Korea, and, as NK News founder Chad O'Carroll notes in a recent article, South Korean prisons were once filled with dozens of North Korean spies arrested over the decades for various types of espionage work. A handful of incidents have continued to occur and at least one involved a spy sent directly from the north. But NK News data suggests that far fewer people have been arrested in South Korea for spy-related offenses since 2017, as the north turns to new technologies, rather than old-fashioned spies, for intelligence gathering. North Korea may be one of the world's poorest and most isolated countries, but previous high-profile defectors have warned that Pyongyang has created an army of 6,000 skilled hackers. According to Mr. Kim, the previous North Korean leader, Kim Jong-il, ordered the training of new personnel in the 1980s to prepare for cyber warfare. The Moran Bong University would pick the brightest students from all over the country and put them through six years of special education he says. British security officials believe that a North Korean unit known as the Lazarus Group was behind a cyber attack that crippled parts of the NHS and other organizations around the world in 2017. The same group is believed to have targeted Sony Pictures in a high-profile hack in 2014. Mr. Kim says the office was known as the 414 Liaison Office. Internally, we dubbed it Kim Jong-il's Information Center. He claims it had a direct telephone line to the North Korean leader. People say these agents are in China, Russia, and Southeast Asian countries, but they also operate in North Korea itself. The office also safeguards communication between North Korean spy agents. Kim Jong-un has recently announced the country is once again facing a crisis and in April he called on his people to prepare for another arduous march, a phrase that has come to describe a disastrous famine in the 1990s, under Kim Jong-il. Thank you for watching. Please, subscribe.